Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Conservatorium of Music at the University of Newcastle, Australia. We're live here in the CBD, and I'm delighted to have some of our wonderful colleagues and students and neighbors join us tonight for a very special version of the Pro Vice Chancellor's Conversations with Thought Leaders. As the College of Human and Social Futures evolves, we're keen to celebrate the success of our partners, our students, and our staff, and today, we have a really exciting conversation. Now, just as a reminder, tonight is a short, sharp way to get to know a couple of amazing people that I know you're gonna appreciate hearing more from in a minute. It's not a formal presentation, and at the end, we can mingle if you'd like, but we're just getting home to have supper or walk the dog or do whatever you need to do to have a great evening. We're doing this to be inspired by people who already have made a mark, but you can see what's happening in the future they're actually changing the world as we speak, and we're gonna learn from them and learn what makes them tick. I wanna to start tonight by acknowledging that we're actually here on the stolen land of the Awabakal and Warmai people here in the CBD in Newcastle. I wanna pay my respects to our Aboriginal colleagues, many in the room, on the Zoom, and those elders past and present. This land has never been ceded, and we have a particular obligation in our college through reconciliation to work together to overcome the injustices to our Aboriginal brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles and those who have come before us. We stand on the shoulders of those elders and we pay special tribute to them tonight. Our college is excited to have some of the foremost academic staff, the most amazingly talented students, and we work in a community that's about overcoming inequity, trying to get things right. Tonight we have Professor David Lubens from the School of Education and the Center for Active Living and Learning, who's here to talk about how he got motivated to be this game-changing global scholar who actually is so impressive. He's the role model for our college of how do you do research that actually makes a difference. We'll follow that with a conversation with Ms. Taylor Gray, who is the first female Aboriginal lawyer who's enrolled in the Newcastle Law School to complete a PhD. She'll be the first PhD Aboriginal woman lawyer from the University of Newcastle. That's pretty incredible. She's already a lawyer and a talented advocate, but we're gonna hear from Taylor about her story, her challenge to all of us, and sort of how did she become who she is, which is just a remarkable colleague, and it's just a pleasure to be associated with people like Dave and Taylor. I also wanna recognize we have Georgie Cooper, who's here tonight. Georgie's the incoming president of the University of Newcastle Student Association, and we're proud to co-sponsor this event with UNSA, and many more events to come. We're only here because of our students, and we wanna make sure we listen to our students and partner with students to sponsor events, both small and large, around the world, or in intimate settings, just to help our students gain what they need to be life-ready graduates and to support them as they become the next thought leaders. Because Georgie, you may be up here in just the next couple of years, you don't know. Uh, Georgie's completing her law degree and, uh, and coming up very soon. So I'm really honored to have the role of facilitating tonight. This is not a formal presentation, as I mentioned, but I think it's about time that we get the show on the road. So without further ado, think of some questions to ask toward the end. We'll have plenty of time for that. I'd be delighted to have Professor Dave Lumens join me on the stage for conversations with thought leaders. Let's welcome Dave. Professor Lubens, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me, John. Nice to be here. Dave is one of the most highly cited scholars, and in academia that means people read your papers, papers and when they write their own, they put your name in their papers, uh, in the university and in the country and in his field. His work uh, is in the human movement area, we'll have him explain in a minute, but really transforming the lives of children and physical activity and understanding how in doing really high level research, we can help improve lives and learning. And Dave, you're one of my heroes, and what I appreciate about you is you live the dream in the sense that you put to practice what you actually study and what you role model for your students and for the community. We'll get to your current work, but could you start with where did you begin to get turn, sort of turned on to the notion of knowledge and research and just continuing to learn? Because you have a story to tell and help fill in some of the dots. Where did this begin? Um, thanks very much, John, and that, that's, a, that's a summer introduction to, to follow on from. 
Um, I guess for me that it started, um, I think it was about the year 2000 and I started doing some casual teaching at the university. I got a bit of a taste for what research was, was like then and at that point I was doing a little bit of uh, teaching physical education at Newcastle High and I was, I was just chatting with Taylor before I came up on the stage and, and um, I was also teaching Newcastle High, teaching rugby, coaching um, the girls rugby team which was one of the highlights of my, um, my, my teaching career. A little bit of, um, of part-time lecturing, just sort of getting a taste of what that was like and thinking about that as a, as a possibility, but then I was offered a, a, a full-time um, teaching position at a private school in Sydney at Barker College, which was a wonderful experience. Again, a lot of coaching, coaching rugby and basketball. Um, won a couple of games, lost more. <laughs> um, but it was, again, I, it was a, a wonderful job. And then I was playing rugby at a reasonable standard, playing first grade in the, in the Sydney competition for, for Northern Suburbs. And, and I was really kind of hoping at that point in time that I might even become a professional rugby player. And once again, that didn't really work out. Uh, but one of the things that did work out that um, when I was at, um, at Newcastle, sorry, when I was at uh, Barker, I had a, an offer to take up a, a master's at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. Um, and it wasn't an academic scholarship. It was, in fact, a, a rugby scholarship. So they offered to, to pay my way, my, uh, my flights and my, um, and my tuition fees, and to, to go there and, and play rugby and to do a one-year master's. And, um, yeah, with, with, a, with, with the, all that opportunity, I couldn't really give it up. I couldn't pass up. And so I, I, I gave up a, a great position of, of, of teaching to do the master's, which then turned into a PhD. Um, I did well enough in my master's that, they, that the rugby wanted me to stay because I'd, I'd done okay on the rugby field and my, um, my studies were, were solid so they wanted me to stay and do a PhD and ended up um, yeah, doing a, a PhD which blew my mind in terms of opening um, to the opportunity of what research meant and, and learning about how to do high quality research understanding about scientific rigour and about um, doing work that would potentially make an impact. And I learned a lot of really good things. I also learned things that I didn't want to do as a supervisor. So it wasn't the perfect experience, but I, I, I got a, a good grounding and that was really, that set me on the path of where I am now. So you obviously have some, um, you didn't get knocked in the head too badly during all those matches apparently, because it's still working pretty well. But who are your inspirations? Um, academically or, um, or, or life-wise? Oh, that's yeah, a good question. This you probably might, might catch you by surprise, but um, I really liked Jack Kerouac when I was growing up. And uh, Ronnie Plotnikoff would appreciate this one because um, Jack Kerouac was a, was, a, was a traveler and it was all about kind of taking opportunities and, and life. And, and in many ways, that's probably kind of summed up my, my life is that uh, I don't fear change. I, I look I'm excited by opportunities, and that's what took me out of the comfort zone of, um, of, of Newcastle, which then took me to Sydney, which then took me to Oxford, and, and now more recently to Finland because, you know, the idea of a new challenge. So Jack Kerouac was one. Um, Research-wise, uh, I guess people like Tom McKenzie and Stu Biddle uh, who who've, have really driven the field in, in school-based physical activity for Tom and physical activity and mental health uh, for Stu Biddle. And now, uh, I mean, I'm lucky enough to call them uh, colleagues. Yeah, well, in your family, was there someone you looked up to who either did have a formal or didn't have a formal education that you stand on her or his shoulders? I mean, my, my, I should have probably mentioned my parents. Thanks for, I, mom and, I didn't tell mum and dad. They probably would have come along tonight. Um, my mum and dad are gra have always been great role models for me, very supportive. They're both educators, um, teachers and, and um, deputy principals, my, my, my father and, and mum. And they were always so supportive, encouraged me again to, to take risks, um, r risks in the sense of getting out of the comfort zone, which is what um, I think sometimes that's hard to do in a place like Newcastle because it is so comfortable and it's very easy to just sort of say this is a, this is a pretty good place to live and I like my a lifestyle and, and not just to take on, on that, um, of getting out of that, that comfort zone into a place where you might, might be challenged and it might, be, um, might not always be easy, but there is something to be said about and that's where I really love the Jack Kerouac, is that, that these, this idea that you know, things will go wrong and um, they become great stories. How did you overcome the tendency, and some of you may not have experienced this, where there's this belief that if you can't um, do sort of regular work, you should become a PE teacher? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's funny, because I, I think that was really an attitude in the United Kingdom. And I taught in the, and there used to be an expression was that if you can't, can't do, teach, and if you can't teach, teach PE. 
Yeah. And so it was pretty, pretty um, insulting to physical education teachers, but I, I don't think that that same um, stigma is attached in Australia because I think we have the best and brightest that, in education yeah. that take on physical education. And many of them are in the room today that have, have gone on and done PhDs and who've got their own careers ahead of them. So I, I think, we've, I think we, have, we attract very high quality people. To oh, there's no people. doubt here, but I think the stigma is there in, in other places, you're right. You've certainly overcome that. Um, in, if you summarize sort of the elevator pitch to someone, what is the nature of your current work? What do you really spend your day doing? Um, I, I guess I'd probably talk a bit about my area and then maybe what I actually do. I, I sort of have two very much interconnected areas and, and obviously it, it, it's, they're, they're relatively broad, but the first one is, is really physical activity promotion in schools. So I'm, I'm all about working with schools to design uh, interventions, implement programs and policies that get uh, children and adolescents more active. So all children of all abilities, um, uh, whether that's physical education, active breaks in the classroom, uh, school sport programs, all of these things are opportunities for physical activity. And the second interrelated area is the effects of physical activity, particularly that's delivered in the school setting, on young people's cognitive and mental health. And I'm really interested in the mechanisms of how that happens. So I get to work with really you know, talented young people that, are, that, are, that, have no way, that know way more than I do about the complexities of, of brain scans and, um, and how to actually interpret that information. But I, I, I'm really fascinated in, in building evidence about why that's good for mental health and why it's also good for cognition and learning. That's changed since you started in your master's degree, hasn't it? We can actually see the brain when it's on fire or not, and we can see what happens uh, in real time when physical activity has motivated the brain to take on new ideas. And for young people in particular, the benefits of that as they take the rest of their courses in school. Yeah, and, and that's really exciting because that, that, again, that technology, as you say, wasn't around John. So in a recent paper, that so I'll, I'll call out Sarah Valkenberg's here because Sarah's, that's really the area that she's been kind of complementing what we've been doing is that we've shown through uh, the Burn to Learn study, through using uh, magnetic resonance imaging, that when kids do high intensity activity and improve their fitness, there is effects on the, the hippocampus, the, the, the part of the brain responsible for, um, for, for memory and learning. So we can see that there's changes that are happening uh, and this is probably one of the first studies to actually demonstrate this in experimental research. There is certainly in young people, there, there, there's probably a fair bit more evidence out there from adult and older adults that um, getting active improves brain structure and function. Um, now we're, we're starting to be able to demonstrate that in young people. And, and that's a really provides a very strong impetus for actually doing more activity and certainly activity that's going to drive improvements in fitness in the school setting. And that's why I say my two areas of research are very much interconnected. Absolutely. Dave, you're currently on a fellowship and have had other sources of funding to help you sort of buy yourself out in education terms to be able to do the research. What's a fellowship? So, um, it's, uh, again, that can come from different sources, but one was a National Health and Medical Research Council fellowship. And effectively, the, um, the, the grant predominantly pays for my salary, so it pays most of my salary, and then sometimes a little bit of a gap, and that then, they use that money then to employ someone, and I'll give Angus a shout out today, because he's here today. So Angus was my former PhD student, who's really um, supported and driven a lot of the research that we're doing, particularly around the Burn to Learn program. And so what that does is that that buys me out of doing, having to do the teaching, it gives Angus an opportunity to to, um, to do some teaching, but also to, to work and, and drive the research that we're doing. So he gets to kind of, uh, to build his career around um, physical activity um, and gets some great papers and also gets teaching experience so that he will then be highly employable. So the reach of your work has gone out through thousands and thousands of citations all around the world. Have you heard back from folks around the world that have adopted what you've been talking about and implementing it elsewhere? I mean, we have stacks of examples from all over the world. I think we have, at the moment, Angus, a guy from India, I think, who's running a project, who's running a, a pile of Burn to Learn. We have schools in Denmark that are doing a resistance training for teams. We've, done, we've got schools in Brazil who've adapted programs that we've been doing, um, some in England as well, and they're the ones that have done or are currently doing, but there's, there's com constantly communications of, um, of, of sort of taking on projects that we've developed Again, I, I think that that impact is really important, but I, I'm just as fascinated in the, the mechanisms and the effects because as a scientist, I don't want, just want to do, do program. I also want to, um, I want to learn more. I want to do things and not, not everything's going to 
come out with a significant value or, or, a, or a meaningful effect size, but trying to understand the, the, the effects of physical activity, it's, for me, it's fascinating, and um, it's the part of the job that I, I find very satisfying. So correct me, because I'm going to get some of this wrong. Sorry, fellas, colleagues. Uh, if we do about 20 minutes of structured high-intensity training, do we get about the same aerobic benefit or physical uh, benefit as if we did a traditional one-hour workout the way we used to? Or what's the, what's the metrics of that so our audience understands what you're kind of coming to realize? Yeah, it's, it's probably, I mean, in terms of the physical activity guidelines, it's kind of... Uh, 30 minutes of for, for adults. It's 30 minutes of, of moderate activity or 15 minutes of vigorous activity. Now, vigorous activity, at the upper end of vigorous, you have high intensity where you could even have as short as 10 minutes. So um, it's sort of two to one from vigorous from vigorous to, to moderate. And then um, we when we work high intensity, we're not talking, there's a, 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 the upper upper end is called sprint interval training, which is where you're working at your 100% max for a very short period of time. And that's actually kind of controversial, that field. There's a lot of, there's probably more replication studies that are needed. So we probably tend to kind of work and, and encourage people at around about 85% of their maximum heart rate. And sometimes they'll get there, sometimes they won't. But, you know, our workouts, we probably say about 10 to 15 minutes is what we're, what we're looking at. And again, we're not, I wouldn't suggest that that's the only thing that, that young people should do or anyone. That's their own. There's no one form of activity that's best. So we really talk about a physical activity smorgasbord. So we want um, young people to develop skills across a wide, a wide range of activities, resistance training, sport, HIIT training, um, active transportation. All of these things are important because they all kind of come together to give you a, like a complete um, a toolkit to be active across the lifespan. And is it found that uh, children who generally do this over a period of time then are also better in their academic subjects and happier in their own way as well? So there's the benefits go well beyond just the physical activity? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and I think it goes across so many outcomes. Obviously, the, your, your cardiometabolic outcomes, but I'm particularly interested in the, in the brain-related outcomes. Mental health and um, cognition, learning, they're very well related, very strongly related to Fitness, probably perhaps even more so than physical activity, that could have to do with the fact that we are uh, we can measure fitness a little bit more accurately. It's harder to measure physical activity accurately, but certainly improving fitness and even fitness as an adolescent seems to have a um, whether that is because fitness as an adolescent tracks into adulthood, but but fitness as an adolescent predicts future um, mental health and cognitive health so, and longevity I think. and longevity absolutely. Yeah. The, it seems in education that the wealthy schools that have resources have research directors themselves and they can take this on board. What are you doing with your team to make sure that there's equity issues addressed, that this gets uh, permeated in schools that may not have that expertise so that they can, all kids can benefit, not just uh, the ones that can afford to buy your research? Yeah, I think the thing is we're, we're really doing that very systematically within the New South Wales government schools because we have... Um, we've got a very good relationship with the school sport unit, so the most up-to-date um, status of the Burn to Learn project, which was our school hit program, is that we've now co-designed with the department a, an online learning module that will be available to every teacher in New South Wales. So um, at least every teacher in New South Wales, but it'll predominantly be taken up by government school teachers. And so it's very egalitarian. It's really available to everyone. We, we don't have that same connection beyond New South Wales, and that's probably something that um, we need to look at. It's, it's kind of hard to, to do that. You kind of need to, um, there is a bit of a, a not invented here challenge, and I think Phil Morgan's probably one of the few people that's really been able to kind of overcome that, because a lot of people only want to implement something that they've been actively involved in developing. So, um, but yeah, we, we've, I think we've got a really good relationship with the department where they, they roll out um, so much of what we've designed, and, and, and that was part of Nick's, Nick Riley's PhD and, and the um, RT for Teens program, which was Sarah Kennedy's PhD, uh, and now with the Burn to Learn, which is Angus's um, PhD. Fantastic. Where do you see this going next? Where do you see yourself in the next few years as you take this well, I'm, next I'm, level. I'm writing another NHMRC investigator grant, so that's where, that's, hopefully that's what I, and I, um, hopefully will be another one of those. <laughs> I've got one more year of funding in my current uh, NHMRC, and so at the moment I'm putting together a program of research that represents all of the ideas that I've spoken about, testing new um, implementation support strategies as well, because it's not just about building evidence, it's not just about building interventions, it's also about testing ways to support implementation at scale. 
So it's no good if I can do an intervention in one school with 30 kids. I need to be able to design something that can be done in 3,000 schools. And so the question is, how do we best support when that kind of gets scaled up? And uh, there's interesting questions around that. This may be a question we don't have the evidence because we're in the journey. My theory is that we're all suffering from long COVID, if that's figurative, if not literal, meaning that we haven't found our groove back yet. We're even interactions in places like this still feel funny because we got used to not doing them. In your work, particularly in schools or with your own team, how do we overcome the lethargy of sort of a lot of people still not finding the best version of themselves? How does your work interplay with that? And I know it's speculative because we didn't do the randomized control trial yet, but how, what's your advice even to your own team to stay positive and stay optimistic and get through whatever we've been doing? Yeah, I, I definitely feel that we, we do have to um, move, move forward and it was interesting looking at different countries and the way that they've um, adjusted to COVID because having just come back from Finland it was like there was no such thing as COVID like there was actually signs occasionally but the way that people behaved it was everything was just completely back to normal but when I was travelling um, through Hong Kong airport and, and, and the, the rules were very strict and it was a, there was a fair bit of control I, I feel like we, if we, want to, we need to get back to the way um, there's obviously some precautions that we should still take at various times, but I, I think our best lives are when we're connected with human beings physically. Zoom kind of solved a few problems and it helped us to get through, but there is no substitute. Drinking online with, with friends and colleagues is not the same as, as meeting up for a conference. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to getting back to conference for, not, not for just drinking, John, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but connecting with human beings. In your work with your colleagues, not just your students, uh, when you're offering advice on how they can scale, even if their subject is way different, I know you serve in that role a lot for us in our college, what's the advice you give or might give to a master's or PhD student or an undergraduate here who's thinking about her own research in the future for how to get that niche, your own IP basically that you figured out? How do you begin to think about that? Because it's really impressive, Dave, but it's a little intimidating because we all want to be like you, but we don't know how. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a tough one. I, I think actually, I, I think, funny thing, I compare myself to Phil and, and what Phil's done is really unique in his approach, um, but we had such a different view on how to do that. And I know, and I won't get into the details of how Phil went ahead with the Dads, Dads and Daughters program, but I, I've probably had more of a, a view towards thinking about scalability from the start. And so thinking about how, do we, how does this look when I'm not delivering it? So that's probably the first thing. So I think I made the first mistake in my PhD in a few earlier projects where there were so many bells and whistles and there were so many parts to it, it was so complex, it was never going to be something that could be delivered at scale. So as I've gotten more uh, experience in this field, it's been thinking about what is this gonna look like when I step back? What are the, what are the, um, you know, what, what is the, what is a, a real scalable project? And the next thing is, is having the right partners from the start. So, IP is a bit of a, 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 a strange concept in the field that we work because it, none of this is about making money for, for me or my team or for, um, or for who we work with. It's really about making it available and getting it out to as many people as possible. And, and again, I think, you know, Ron and I spoke about this earlier in the public health in particular, and I think education suffers from the same kind of, um, you know, whether it's a problem or not, but it's about um, public benefit. And so it's not about money it's about trying to get it out as much, to as many people and having the partners involved early on and sort of even if we're driving the content and how it works and putting everything into it, um, which is probably our more recent program, is, is called Learning to Lead. Uh, and the department have been heavily involved in, in all sorts of that and, and we'll make it completely available to, to them at no cost at the end of the study and, that, and I have no doubt that will support its scale up and its ongoing life. Um, but then again, if we want to do it in other schools around, um, around the country or around the world, we can do that. But it's not, again, it's not about an IP issue as such, it's no. about getting it out there. You know, one of the things I tell young people that before about age 12, there's nothing that you're really in control over in your lives unless you've been left alone, in that your parents choose what you're going to eat and what you wear, and the teachers tell you what to do, and you're not even able to do certain stuff legally, even if you're thinking you could otherwise. But the one thing you're in control over is to choose your friends and choose wisely. It sounds like, Dave, you've chosen also the mates you hang around with, the, the people you intellectually motivate with. And I think the message that I take from you is get yourself surrounded by people that get you and make you better and dreams can come true. 
Dave, we're going to hold off on uh, further questions at this time. I'm going to get have Taylor come up in just a second, but please think of some questions for Professor Lubens. In just a few minutes, we'll have him back. David, you're such a great uh, colleague, just a tremendous role model, and I think your best ideas are still to come. We just don't know what they are yet. Not too much pressure, I hope. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for coming, Dave. Thanks, John. Thank you. Now we'll ask Taylor Gray to join us on the stage, and thanks so much to Dave. Just really insightful and so inspirational. I get to work around a lot of smart people every day, and there's none more capable and smarter than Taylor. And Taylor, it's so <laughs> great to have you here. You're one of my inspirations for the work you've done and all that you know you're going to do in the future to promote your own um, reality of your own excellence, but also on behalf of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the injustices of the past. Take us on a journey where you start to understand your own capabilities. Where does that start for you? Well, firstly, I just want to acknowledge country as well. Um, not just acknowledge, but honour that we are still on the unceded lands of the Awabakal people, is, was and always will be. Um, I, in my younger years, I always knew I had something. Like, I was destined for something bigger. Um, what that was, I had no idea at the time. But I think my father was my biggest encouragement because no matter what I did, he would always say to me, just do your best. And I'd say, hey, Dad, like, I have my athletics carnival today. Good job. Do your best. <laughs> um, you know, I have my HSC today. Just do your best. And I think everywhere I go, I carry that mentality too. It, it doesn't matter what I do, just do your best. And I think, you know, my best on a Monday will look different to my best on a Wednesday. But as long as I'm doing my best, like, what else could harm me? And I guess I, my journey kind of started in when I was throughout primary school, where um, I used to, I, I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, and I used to debate back and forth with my best friend um, in her lounge room. What we'd argue about, I have no idea. But I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, and then I, I used the motivation of my father, who's a stolen generation survivor. And he always used to tell me, um, like, he'd say, Dort, like, when I was, you know, when I grew up, I, I always sat at the, we had to sit at the back of the classroom. Blackfellas had to sit at the back. And, you know, I took that motivation and used it all throughout my primary school, high school, and even university. And I would make the effort to sit at the front of the classroom because my father never had the right to do so himself. And, you know, I failed all my year 11 and 12 um, legal studies exams, every assessment. Um, but I still did my best. And, you know, eventually in my final year of law school, I ended up topping the class and coming first for the advanced legal writing and research course, which is a 10,000 word thesis. And as long as I did my best, that's all that mattered. Yeah, fantastic. It'd be wonderful to find those teachers in that year 11 class and send them a copy of that the transcript <laughs> and say, look at me now. <laughs> uh, that's, it's amazing how those expressions that our families use with us last, whether they're positive or negative. Uh, your father grew up on a mission um, and in the stolen generation, the lessons learned. How do you weave that into your thinking of that, those shoulders you stand on, of all the amazing people who had land stolen, lives altered, in some cases lives taken, and yeah. put it into practice for the kind of lawyer you are and the kind of PhD study you're doing. Yeah, it follows me everywhere I go, because I always think, you know, my family never had the opportunity to do this. Uh, you know, I'm the first to go to university in my family. My mum um, works at a takeaway fish and chip shop, and, you know, my dad's a carer, but I wouldn't change them for the world. Um, and it's motivation, because, you know, I and my community too, you know, I come from a drug and alcohol community, you know, I come from social housing, but, and it's good because it's set me up on, you know, the type of leader and the type of person I want to be and to never look down on people, um, you know, because I come from these communities mm -hmm. and I know what it's like to, to be there and to be the, like that person as well. And I, you know, I think it's just, you take that motivation and you apply it. If, if you look at the PhD study, uh, PhD study you're doing now, how does that relate to the kind of land rights that you want to advocate for to overcome all the injustice of stolen land over 300 years or so? 
Yeah, I, I um, look, all throughout high school, you know, when I used to go to my friend's house, I, you know, and I, I had a lot of non-Indigenous friends as well, and I, I had a lot of First Nations, you know, family and friends too. But every time I went to non-Indigenous people's houses, they, you know, they were stunning. They owned their own homes. And, you know, when I went to my cousin's house, we had overcrowding houses. And I thought, why, why, where's hell? Why don't we get any land? Like, why are we so poor? Um, and then, you know, as I started to grow up and read more and think more, like, and understanding the, you know, the, the consequences of colonialism on, on this soul and land, I, I get it now. And I thought something, what, what can we do for land equality in this country? And I remember it was fourth year of law school, I, I did the property course, and one of the um, essay questions was on native title, and I chose it, um, and I loved it. And then I ended up turning that into my honours thesis, and then I loved it even more, and I was like, I'm going to turn this into a PhD. And so that's what I'm doing now, and I, and I thought, you know, land reform, like I'm just really passionate about it. Tell the story of the protest that you helped uh, organize and then help get approved. Uh, our listeners might not know, or anything that was BC or during C, C is the word that we're trying not to fill the blank in for here, but Taylor helped advocate for a Black Lives Matter march in Newcastle. It wasn't permitted uh, because of COVID reasons at the time, and she advocated to the Supreme Court and as a student at the time, won the case, which is pretty good work integrated learning for those uh, who are thinking that that's hard to do. Taylor sort of got the A plus in that as well. How did yeah. you come to realize that this was your calling to help make this happen? That was a really important time uh, that was coinciding with the pandemic and you didn't let justice get in the way. And what, what motivated you to say, we can do this? Dr. John Woodward, um, he, I remember, when I sat in his civil dispute resolution class, um, and one of the things he said to our class, he's like, where are all the students? Why aren't they protesting? Look at all the inequality that's happening. And I'm a very competitive person. I love sport and I, I love, I just, I'm very competitive. I love to come first and be the best at everything. Um, and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna be out there and I'm gonna protest. And I think when the whole Black Lives Matter movement was happening, um, you know, we had very furious people, you know, First Nations mob were sick of being unheard. Our cries were unheard. And, you know, we ran the first protest, which was allowed. And then, you know, I, I had another sister say to me, hey, Taylor, why don't you run the second one? And I said, what, me? I said, I don't know if I can do that. But I said, but I'll do it anyway. And so I did. Um, and what happened is, you know, I asked the police permission to do this, um, you know, and they knocked us back. And at the time, you know, they said, if you continue to go ahead with this protest, we're going to take you to the Supreme Court. And if you lose, we're going to hit you with a cost order. And for the non-legal people, like a cost order is, you know, if, if you lose court, uh, you have to pay all the court fees and the barristers' fees and the instructing solicitors' fees. And, you know, as a fourth year law student, I'm quite, you know, intimidated. I'm going up, you know, with a butter knife against this huge company with tanks and machine guns. But I thought, just do your best, see how you go. And we did, and we won. And then we ended up getting a cost order where the police had to pay my fees, <laughs> which was nice. <laughs> and I think it would have been about over $20,000. So there was, there was a lot on the line, but, you know, I was driven by justice and seeking change. And, you know, I, I think as leaders, you, you, have to, you have to envision a world before anybody else can see it. Yeah. And I could see that protest already happening, you know, before anybody else. And we ended up going through with it. And my community, you know, I, I had not just First Nations people backing me, but non-Indigenous people too. And, you know, once... Once you have that type of support from your community, like it's, n nothing can stop you. And because I live right where the protest was happening, it went off totally without a hitch. In fact, the police were very supportive. It actually showed that people working together can allow yeah. um, 
the opportunity for protests to be part of what a democracy allows. And it went, I think it went maybe from Pacific Park to Civic Park or something in that range, and it went beautifully, and people did have the right then to say their, their piece, but it also seemed to be a positive experience for those to enforce the road closures and everything. It went really smoothly. Yeah. So yeah. what's the next protest? <laughs> what are we protesting? Oh, I, I don't, I'm, I'm going to leave it to, a, I know I'm young myself, but I'll leave it to the next generation coming <laughs> through, I think. <laughs> What does reconciliation mean to you? What would it look like? And can it happen in our lifetime uh, in the sense that we're on a journey, but what do you see in that crystal ball you just said you have, that we can do right by 60,000 years of legacy and the, the longest standing civilized people in the world um, that we stand on the shoulders of here tonight? I'm skeptical of the, world, of the word reconciliation. I'm very skeptical of that word because when we think of, you know, coming to a land, you know, and executing violence and massacres, I, I think, what do black people have to reconcile with? You know, and, and when I apply that analogy to, um, I read this somewhere, the analogy of, you, you think of domestic violence, for example, and the victim of domestic violence never has to reconcile with their abuser. Why should they? And it's the same with First Nations people. Why do we have to reconcile with you know, a, a people that have come here and caused us harm and stripped us of our language and our dignity and our land and its resources. And I'm, I'm just, I'm very skeptical of the word reconcile. I, I, I think, you know, if we're gonna move forward, we need a treaty mm -hmm. because a treaty is a promise between two people to take the best possible care of each other. I think that's really profound and I really admire how you've articulated but also challenged us and I think it does take then listening, listening to stories to be able to understand what you just said and also the stories of those from the stolen generation, those who have the stories of their mob prior and all the stories over the years of the incredible culture and art and science and education and values that is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history mm -hmm. uh, to really understand, to change that word and also to own what it is we need to do. Um, that was beautifully said. Thank you. Yeah, stories, stories. I like, there's a writer, um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and she says um, stories are powerful. Stories have been used to dispossess people and to align, and, you know, words are powerful. Um, I mean, we think of the word terrenalius. Um, mm. Words are powerful. Stories are powerful, too. When you're not thinking this hard, and changing the world, which you're doing and have already done, what do you do to stay fresh and healthy? And uh, are you doing the 20 minutes, 30 minutes of high intensity training, or uh, <laughs> are you still playing rugby? Yeah, I, I, I keep active. I love keeping active, um, but I, I love to read. I love exercising my brain. Um, and if I, you know, if, if I was somewhere unread and unknown, I'd still be sitting under a tree reading and learning because that's what I love doing every day. Uh, you know, reading an article or a book um, and getting outdoors and doing yoga, but just keeping active, keeping the mind active too. And in your week, how do you pace yourself between the serious things you're studying, reading, writing about, and just taking a break from that and just enjoying? Like we're here, we are in spring, it hasn't I hope it's not raining right this second, but it's been raining too much to get out and just really take in country and be part of the glory of this region of the world. Yeah, I think the best way to honour my ancestors is to not grind my body to exhaustion for a capitalist system. Um, and some of my work actually looks at capitalism. And the more I read into it, I, I think, you know, if I have to rest today, then I'm going to rest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I shared this thing on Instagram the other night and it's like, when, when you choose consciously to take a rest day, you do it for everybody because you, you're normalising, yeah, you, you're normalising this behaviour of resting. And, you know, other people, when they see you rest, it's like, hey, like, she's not grinding all the time, she's not working all the time. Maybe I can take a step back and rest too. Yeah, we got to look out for each other that way and remind ourselves too. It's like staying hydrated. Sometimes you're so <laughs> thirsty, you don't remember you're thirsty. Sometimes you just need a break when you're yeah. working that hard. In the world today, um, like someone like Greta, the climate change activist, she's like Cher or Bono, she goes by one word, 19 years old, has really put herself out there. You know, just a few years ago when 
um, she was in school, she was mute on suicide watch and labeled by her teachers as unable to learn. And then she did a climate change uh, protest for the elimination of climate change, sat on the, te uh, the steps at her town hall. Somebody brought her takeaway and she just found her niche. Mm. How do we find, the, and now she's a global spokesperson, probably the leading spokesperson to call out policy that actually is backwards. How do we find more tailors in year seven, eight, nine, to inspire them as you inspire me and us <laughs> to take the leadership to say we can make a difference, we have to call things out, but we've got to improve and make that next generation um, have a better life. And we can learn from the past and honor our history. How do we get more people fired up to be willing to take the risks that you've already been able to take? Yeah, well, the world doesn't need more tailors, I think. It would be a terrible place if it was. But I think we need more peacemakers, though. I think we need more negotiators. Um, greater, you know, peacemakers, I think, is a really big thing. Because there's a lot of war, there's a lot of disputes in this country. Um, and we haven't, you know, we haven't settled a lot of things here, but I think we need more peacemakers. But, you know, if, if we're going to... I value young people. Um, and if we're going to, like, support them, I think, I think they need to have more mentors. I mean, that's what got me through, you know, primary, high school. And, you know, and in my... I, like I said, I, I, my HSC score was so low, I didn't even get a mark. But I did a pathway into um, university. And I had a great mentor. And I submitted an assignment one time. And she pulled me aside and she said, Hey, Taylor, I think you can do a little better than that. And you know what? I thought to myself, yeah, I could. And she's like, why don't you have another go and submit it? And you know, and I read my work and I was like, oh, I can improve on this. You know, and she showed me how to do it. Um, and you know, I, I went from a credit to a high distinction. And it's just, it's just because that person sat down and said, hey, Taylor, you can do a little better. And just having someone believe in you. Yeah, that's the voice in your head saying, do your best. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it comes full circle. <laughs> Taylor, it's been a pleasure to start to get to know you tonight. I know our audience is in deep admiration for what you've done and what we know you're going to do. We want to join you in your next protest. If you can tweet us or text us or Instagram <laughs> us, that would be helpful. We're going to ask you to stay on stage, invite Dave to come back. We're going to take about a 30-second mini stage break and bring another chair up. And we're going to open our questions to you both here in the audience, in the conservatorium, and those online. So there's a QR code, I think, being activated for those online to be able to text in your questions. And we'll take some questions from the audience here in just about 30 seconds. Taylor, on behalf of all of us, you're an inspiration. And we are really appreciative that you came to share your story with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chad, are some questions out there? Do you want to start with the first question you might have from the audience? And please, jump right in. We've got about a 20-minute window here, and we'd love to hear from you. Chad, what might be our first question? I'll come to the audience in a second, guys, and we do have a few questions on Slido as well. But Taylor, I kind of wanted to ask you, we've talked a bit about protest. It's becoming, not in, and not just in regards to First Nations rights, it's becoming harder and harder to protest in Australia about climate, about anything, really. How important is protest, in your view, to being able to implement and affect real change? Oh, I, I think it goes, out, goes without saying. It's really important. You know, when you have a collective group of people who believe in something, how, how is the government ever going to stop that? Um, I think it's really important. I think more of our young people should, you know, take the ropes and back one another, you know, especially in relation to, like, climate change and racial justice and, you know, you know, disability injustice as well. Like, I think we need more young people out on the streets protesting as well. Mm -hmm. Have we got any questions from the audience? Yes? Just quickly come in here for you. On um, getting more young people <clears throat> protesting, how do we encourage and inspire young people to get out from behind the social media screen and the collectivism sort of wave, not just young people, but all people, and to actually get into the streets. Um, I know that I'm guilty of being a bit of a keyboard, like, <laughs> yeah, I support this, but yeah. not actually turning up on the day. So how do we get more people on the streets and in person? 
I wish I had the answer. You know, when we, when we ran the first Black Lives Matter protest, it was massive. There were so many people there. And then I ran the second Black, Life, uh, Black Lives Matter protest and the numbers declined and I was like, where is everybody? Um, uh, I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> and then I ran the um, Invasion Day rally too on the 26th of January and I, you know, the numbers are constantly declining. It really is a trending thing and we must ask ourselves, do we care about this or do we only care because it's trending at the moment? So the average Australian's online nine hours a day now. Some of you know who you are and three hours of that in social media. Most of that social media is either A, looking at kitty cats, or B, <laughs> being fed fake news. Uh, and so, great question. Yeah, definitely. I'm gonna go to Slido now, and a question for you, Dave. When you're implementing some of your research in schools, and you've got a wide variety of students of varying sizes and athletic ability, what are some of the challenges involved with, with implementing your research? Uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. And I guess one of the things that we, we try to do, we actually have a, a set of principles that we teach teachers. So whether it's a program around HIIT training or resistance training or, or um, a, a sport-related program, we have what we call the SAFE principles, which is supportive, active, autonomous, fair, and enjoyable. And so our strategy is that we teach teachers not just the activity, but also how to support students' basic psychological needs. So making sure that we are modifying activities for students with, um, with a disability, uh, making it easier or harder for students with high or, or lower fitness levels. Um, and, and I guess we build that into our training and we build that into the, the way that the professional learning works for teachers, but we also uh, use additional kind of uh, support strategies for teachers. So we'll often have um, observations of, of sessions as once the programs are up and running to, to, sh to ensure that, um, uh, that teachers are feeling supported in the way that they deliver it. So it, it's, a, it's a very important and yeah, obviously looking at uh, implementation of those approaches. Thank you. I've got another one here that probably comes off the back of that from Rachel. Um, at what ages do you feel your methodology works best for students? And are there any particular types of exercises or training programs that are most effective? Um, so the question was, uh, which is the most appropriate by age? age in, yeah, 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 in terms of age and, and I yeah, guess... So I guess one of the things that we kind of take a lifetime approach to physical activity. So the kinds of things that you might do in primary schools or with really young students is not what you're going to do with senior school students. So our approach to HIIT training is really targeting towards older adolescents as they're just about to leave school and, and the, the real focus and the sales pitch is time efficiency and that they, these are students that we're trying to take a little bit of curriculum time and get a really short, sharp, high intensity dose. If we're working with, um, with children in primary schools, the focus is really on fundamental movement skills or foundational skills that you know, enable them to, to play um, sports and activities. So teaching them how to throw, kick, jump, run, um, learn the foundations, you start to build on that through early adolescence. And so by the time they're progressing into older adolescence, just as they're about to leave school, it's really about physical activity independence. So that they've got the, the foundations of sports and they can provide, a, and that's what I mean by the, the toolkit. By the end of school, they've got things that they could do across uh, a whole variety of activities. Thank you. I'm going to go back to the audience. Have we got anybody willing to ask a question? Thank you. Um, Dave, it was really good to hear you talk about how you're so open to change and all the opportunities that uh, came your way. Uh, but for some people, change can be a real source of stress and anxiety. So were you always someone that was like open to change or is that something that you sort of grew into? That's a good question. Um, I guess I, I probably have been reasonably open to change. I, when I finished school in Newcastle, uh, I couldn't leave fast enough. I wanted a new challenge. I had great friends and I had a great experience. It wasn't anything bad. I just wanted new. I wanted a new challenge. I wanted a new variety. So I think it maybe was something more intrinsic in me, but I definitely see that in my children. I've got a 13-year-old um, daughter and a 15-year-old son, and um, I, I'm trying to breed in them that same kind of attitude that, that change is opportunity, and um, if it doesn't work out, you know, it's always nice to be able to come back to a place like Newcastle or if you've got a good supportive family. I think it's easier to, to be open to change when you come from a, a place of strength 
because you've, you've kind of got something to come fall back on <laughs> when it doesn't work out. I've always, I think I've always felt like I had that. So I think I, I, had, I must have had it to start with, but I think it's certainly a, a quality that, that I'd really encourage my children and the people that I mentor to have as well because it, uh, it's, it's a strengths-based approach, I think. Yeah, I think your question signaled what Taylor was talking about a little earlier. If you have a mentor that can help guide you, uh, maybe hold your hand literally if you need to go on a journey locally or internationally, that I bet if most people who have found some way to overcome the resistance to change have had someone who tapped them on the shoulder and also who guided them um, maybe that first time. Um, Taylor, you've talked about that with your own father, you've talked about that with your own journey, uh, and I think it's very similar to coming from a mob, coming from a family, coming from a group of people who have each other's back is so crucial. Mm -hmm. A lot of the world doesn't have that, and so what we're going to have to do through education is reach out to make sure everybody is part of something. Otherwise, it's a lonely journey where you're more likely to stay inside than take on those risks. Thank you, John. Uh, we're going to go back to Slido here and a question for Taylor from Jenna. Um, Taylor, one of the big things that you talk about is the incarceration and overrepresentation of First Nations people in Australia. Um, in your opinion, what are some of the, the biggest obstacles to reducing that overrepresentation? Yeah, I think, you know, I've worked, um, I've done a short stint at the Aboriginal Legal Service where I worked as a criminal defence lawyer. Um, and often I, I would see so much trauma coming in. There was so much trauma. Like, where are the services? You know, um, to... I don't want to bore you with legal jargon, but, you know, <laughs> I'm going to bore you with legal jargon. But, you know, you would do what's called a, a Section 14 under the Mental Health Act. And, you know, so when somebody's really unwell, um, they're dealt with under the Mental Health Act and they're given um, a mental health plan um, instead of being dealt with under the criminal law. But, you know, in places like Taree Courthouse, they, there's, there's not a psychologist there to do that. Um, you'd have to go all the way to Port Macquarie to access this service. Um, a lot of my clients never had cars. A lot of my clients never even held mobile phones, you know. There will be times where, because I cared so much about it and getting them a good result, I would actually physically drive, and I probably, I'm probably not allowed to say this, but I would drive to their house and I would pick them up and take them to court, um, you know, because the magistrate tapped me on the shoulder and said, Miss Grave, your client's not here. Um, I'm sending a warrant out for their arrest. And I'm kind of like, ah, like, I need to do something about this. But it's the vulnerability, it's the traumas, it's, you know, helping people, like, it's... It's not even having adequate housing. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who don't even have homes to go to, so how are they going to get bail? A lot of people, you know, they'll say, I'm going back into jail because it's, you know, I get three meals a day, I get a bed, I, you know, I get a roof over my head too. You know, a lot of the criminal law is entwined with social justice. People need houses, people need food, people need, you know, a safe home to go to that's, you know, not tra traumatic, you know, that, that a lot of us take for granted. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Taylor. We're going to go back to the audience. Have we got a question, guys? Yes, no. Start here. Thank you. My question's for David. Um, you talked so much about the benefits of exercise and, and well-being in, for PE students, but I was wondering if you had any tips for us employers and managers in the room of how we can incorporate these into the workday when we don't have PE scheduled every day. Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do with the, with the HIT stuff is that we're trying to change curriculum in schools and in, and in some ways that overlaps with the workplace because the current kind of workplace practices is that physical activity breaks are not part of the day. Um, I think that there's a, there's a real strong advocacy for actually making physical activity breaks part of the day um, and really supporting opportunities to be active, whether that is a, a yoga session or a, or a hit session, it doesn't have to be, or it could be just, just a walk. Finding ways to encourage and support your staff to do that, because the data are, uh, are so convincing that, um, you know, if they're more active, they're healthier, they're sick less, less absentee, more um, uh, satisfaction at, at work. So finding ways to, to support active breaks uh, is really important. It doesn't have to be expensive, it doesn't have to be complicated, it doesn't really have to be structured, 
but promoting. Um, you know, take, take some time off. Uh, I think we do it very well at, in our uh, call centre. We have a culture of, of breaks, whether that's, you know, go and play a game of basketball or, or um, you know, some group will do uh, some resistance training. Uh, but I think we have a very much a strong understanding that we, we, we think better, we work better, we're happier when, we're, when we get some activity. Chad, what do you think? We got time for one more? I think we've, we've got another about five or six minutes, so yeah, we can probably get a couple more in. And Dave, that might be something that you can tape up, take up with John to implement college-wide bit of physical activity through the day. That yeah, great. Well, all you got to do is organise it. You got the you got the power. Um, so my question's for Taylor. Um, I actually have goosebumps, like when you're talking, and a lot of this stuff is quite emotionally heavy. And I suppose my question is, how do you how do you take care of your own mental health when you're when your work is so emotionally heavy and how do you come home from work and disconnect yourself from that? Like, yeah. I don't, it's tricky, you know, because I'm so connected, you know, to my community, my mob, you know, and I have an obligation, you know, to, to other First Nations mob to do better. Um, but you just, you try and you, you know, you sit with it, you sit with country, you talk to your elders, you talk to your mentors and say like, hey, am I on the right track? Like, am I doing okay? You know, and I remember having this young person who was extremely vulnerable and, you know, I like to consider myself a bit, you know, thick skinned, but, you know, one time I came home from court um, and it was my first client that actually got sent to juvie and I came home and I was a uh, and I thought, oh, I didn't think much of it. And then later on, it, it caught back up to me. And I'm like, man, this is tough. You know, I just had this young person go to um, juvie. Is there, you know, there's nothing else I could do about it. But it's difficult to separate yourself from passion. <laughs> because my passion will never leave. Um, but I think you have, to sit, you have to sit with it. You have to be aware. You have to have good support networks to talk to good mentors and elders. I, I think our old people are the best people to talk to and say like, hey, this happened today. And just speaking about it, I think talking to a friend um, helps. <laughs> I mean, it takes off 50% of the stress when you just tell somebody like, hey, this is my problem. But yeah. Do we have time for one more, John? All Let's right. do one more. Any more questions from the crowd? I know we've had a lot here. Anybody up here? Um, I wanted to ask you, Dave, about a little bit about nutrition and um, eating for young people, because that's so intricately intertwined with physical activity and health. Um, is there a component of that to your programs as well, that sort of education? I, I, firstly, you're absolutely right. It's, it's so essential. And in the past, we've done quite a bit um, with Claire Collins and, and, the, and the team in nutrition at the University of Newcastle. I guess what I've kind of come to the point is that I can't do everything <laughs> and it's hard enough trying to get uh, a really good grasp on the physical activity and changing that aspect of adolescents' lives. They're so intricately linked, as you, as you point out, um, but I kind of have to sort of draw the line somewhere and I've kind of felt, well, physical activity is where my real passion is and where I feel like I can have the biggest impact um, and so rather than sort of trying to spread myself into uh, too thin into nutrition, I, I feel like I've, I've stayed focused on my core kind of um, expertise and interest. So it's so important and we do work with nutrition, um, but it's just not my, not my uh, focus at the moment. Interesting too when people make one change that's positive in their life, um, like getting active, then do you see that they start to get interested in those other Absolutely. areas too? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was probably, I originally started with just physical activity and then what you've just described is what happened where you start working with adolescents, you start, they start caring about how they're active, they start thinking about what they're eating and then um, and I went down that pathway and then I just sort of got to the point where I kind of had to make a decision as an academic in terms of specialisation and being able to really focus in an area and become known in an area and I realised that I just didn't have the scope within my uh, my my time to be an expert in nutrition and I've just sort of stayed at focus in physical activity and I guess I have more interest around how that affects uh, the the brain mental health cognition so super important but I've only got so many hours <laughs> if I could let's put our hands together for Taylor and Dave and 
I'm going to invite Georgie Cooper, the incoming president of the University of Newcastle Student Association, to join us for a vote of thanks. Georgie, thanks for coming tonight. We appreciate your being here and representing UNSA. Our collaboration for this event and others in the future will represent our college's commitment to making sure we're listening to students, but also celebrating with them their great success. Thank you so much, John. Um, well done on hosting tonight, as always. Um, thank you for guiding the discussions with the fantastic panelists. It's been so fantastic to listen to um, everything um, that's come up and across your quite diverse areas, but some common themes that I think kind of came out of the discussions. Um, so, um, both firstly, in kind of the area of taking opportunities that come up to you, taking risks and putting yourself out there to follow your passions, I think was something that both of our um, uh, both of the panelists this evening touched on, um, which I think is inspiring for all of us, um, yeah, going through uni and outside as well. Um, and then I think both of the panelists really work on um, looking to help people in the areas that they work in, whether that's in Indigenous rights for Taylor or for, yeah, physical activity for young people and old people um, in Dave's case. So um, I think they both have, yeah, great passions in those areas. So it was cool to see them kind of um, side by side this evening in conversation. Um, some other things that came out that I that stood out to me was the importance of connection between people in both of your works and bringing people together and the power of doing things yeah, in community and, and with each other um, was something I think we can take away. Um, also the importance, um, which is particularly noticeable this time of year coming to an, into exam season with uni, the importance of looking after ourselves and, and each other, whether that's through physical exercise, getting a break, looking after our mental health as well. Um, and yeah, reaching out to friends and mentors and family, um, I think are all things that we can all do in our everyday lives as well. Um, yeah, so I re really want to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for your time this evening and inspiring all of us to think on what you um, spoke to us about, about your passions and finding our own passions and implementing some of the things that um, you've uh, yeah, recommended to us. Thank you again, John, for hosting. Thank you to the college for putting on this event in partnership with UNSA. We look forward to having more of them happen in the future. Thank you to the organisers for this evening. Um, and yeah, thank you for having me to wrap up this evening. I've really appreciated it. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you so much. As we close tonight, just a couple of reminders. First of all, the goal tonight was to, if you could get here a few minutes early, to enjoy each other's company and have a drink or some nibbles. But afterwards, we're gonna say, just go home and have the rest of the evening, get out of here. But you're welcome to meet and greet just as long as uh, our participants can stay. But thank you again for coming. Our college represents the diverse subjects in business and law, education, creative industries, humanities, social sciences. And across that, you see the range of topics and passions and expertise that just makes it a joy to be part of. I think you'll agree, if the world can get better, it's gonna come because of the great work of people like Taylor and Dave and all of you. But I'm very optimistic that by we bring our college together and we start to add up the difference we're making, it's quite extraordinary. So whatever you take from this, if it's that vitamin that you needed to get yourself through the rest of this week, go off and make a difference. And I think that means we'll also take Taylor's dad's advice and say, do your best. <laughs> Um, on behalf of our college, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions tonight of Professor Lubins and Taylor Gray. What we do in recognition is we put a donation to the University of Newcastle and our college Asylum Seekers Scholarship Fund. And so on the webpage, when we get to update it in the next few days, for both Dave and Taylor, it'll recognize that a contribution has been made on behalf of them to our Asylum Seeker Scholarship Fund, which is helping people who are here in Australia able to stay and study while they're trying to sort out the issues that have forced them to leave their country. So on behalf of us, we really appreciate your expertise, your passion, and the, the joy of spending time with you. And we're dedicating this and trying to pay it forward as well. To Chad and to Jess and the team in our college to put it together, uh, fantastic. Our technical team who's been able to make little glitches work that you didn't even know were happening behind the scenes. Thank you very much to the rest of you. Have a great night. Thank you for coming. Leave inspired and let's make a difference. Thanks so much.